Good evening. Hafiz Saeed, the chief of terror outfit Jamaat ud dawa the mastermind of the 2611 Mumbai attack, has floated a political party. It's called the Milli Muslim League. This is a man who has the blood of hundreds of people on his hands. This is a man who has a $10 million bounty on his head. This is also a man who might contest the next federal election in Pakistan. And who knows, take office in that country. On Gravitas tonight, as we examine why Hafiz Saeed decided to enter politics, we are also asking the bigger question, will the world stand by and watch? Yes, Pakistan's duplicitous dealings with terrorists have been exposed yet again, but what about the West that is letting this happen and not declaring Pakistan a state sponsor of terrorism? I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay, the headlines first. What's being viewed as a blatant affront to democracy, Venezuela's state prosecutor Maduro's main challenger has been fired from his position, has accused uh, Maduro of human rights abuses. This is what the Western media is reporting. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson says Russian meddling in American presidential elections created serious mistrust, says United States will respond to Moscow's expulsion of diplomats. South Korean prosecutors seeking a 12-year jail term for Samsung Electronics' vice chairman Lee on bribery charges. Lee continues denying any wrongdoing. National Conference leaders Omar and Farooq Abdullah hold a meeting of opposition parties amid reports that the center is planning to review Article 35A that defines the residence of Jammu and Kashmir. As always, some specials for you on the show. It's not just Donald Trump who's dropping on the popularity charts. Which other world leaders are losing local support? We'll tell you all about that. We talk about revenge and talks in the same breath. What's going on between the US and North Korea? What are the new sanctions all about? And who do they impact the most? Also, why has Israel banned Al Jazeera? Is Netanyahu colluding with Arab states against Qatar? Was Al Jazeera's coverage biased? And then if it was, is ban the best answer? And the story of Princess Diana in her own words, we tell you why a new documentary is making waves the world over. But first to the story of terror mastermind Hafiz Saeed, who's floated a political party this evening to contest elections in Pakistan. In 2012, remember, the U.S. had branded Saeed a global terrorist with a $10 million bounty on his head. There are innumerable terror cases against this man here in India, also in Pakistan. Saeed is under house arrest in his own country fighting a Mumbai terror attack case. Despite this, Islamabad has allowed this man to rebrand the Jamaat ud dawa His new outfit will be called the Milli Muslim League. And he might as well contest elections. How is the Pakistan government or its constitutional agencies allowing Hafiz Saeed to form a political party is the big question, let alone contest elections. The prerequisite, according to the Pakistan Election Commission website, is that a person has to have quote-unquote good character and uh, is not commonly known as one who violates Islamic injunctions. He practices obligatory duties prescribed by Islam as well as abstains from major sins. This is what the Pakistani establishment requires of people who become a part of parliament. This person has to be sagacious, righteous, non-profligate and honest. He should be convicted, not be convicted for a crime involving moral turpitude or for giving false evidence and a person with good moral reputation. Tonight, Gravitas asks the Pakistani government, do you think a terrorist like Hafiz Saeed has any of the above qualifications? Hafiz Saeed's aides announced the formation of the Milli Muslim League Pakistan today, right under the nose of the government, sitting in the seat of power in the capital city of Islamabad. Saeed's aides spoke about terror gripping Pakistan and how the society is reeling under the fear of terrorists. They continued with their self-righteous barbs calling for a Pakistan which should be ruled according to Islamic laws. Sadaq <laughs> 
اپنی اصلاح کی بجائے آئین کی دفعہ باسٹھ اور تریسٹھ کو سرے سے ختم کرنے کی کوشش کی جا رہی ہیں یعنی اقتدار پر قابض بعض لوگ کرپشن کو قانونی حیثیت دینے کی کوشش کر رہے ہیں تخریب کاری اور دہشت گردی خطرناک صورتحال اختیار کر چکی ہے جس کی سب سے بڑی وجہ یہ ہے کہ پاکستان میں اتحاد اور اقاندت کی بہت کمی ہے اور دشمن وطن عزیز کو عدم استحقام سے دوچار کرنے کی ساشوں میں کامیاب دکھائی دیتا ہے اس وقت ایک خلا کی قیفیت ہے جسے کل کرنے کی ضرورت ہے ہمارے پاس اللہ کے قدر و کرم سے نظریہ پاکستان کا اتحار ہے so how does the government of India see this? This is what the Ministry of External Affairs had to say when the first reports of Hafiz Saeed looking to form a political party emerged. Listen in. It appears that a person whose hands are stained with blood of innocent lives is perhaps it's, it's both ironical and concerning, disconcerting to notice that such an individual is perhaps uh, wanting to hide his blood stained hand, hands uh, behind the uh, behind the balloting, or is he trying, the person who has traded in bullets to take human lives, innocent lives, is he trying to hide behind ballot? That's a matter of concern. India, of course, is concerned about the events unfolding in Pakistan. And it ought to be considering a terrorist who is looking to participate in the electoral process in the neighborhood, in a country which has been politically unstable since its inception. The new Milli Muslim League party uh, will follow the ideology of the Jamaat ud dawa which the U.S. says is a front for the band lashkar e toiba and is run by Hafiz Saeed, the alleged mastermind of the 2008 Mumbai terror attack that left 166 people dead. In June 2016, Hafiz Saeed held a rally to protest the killing of the Taliban chief Mullah Omar, Mullah Akhtar Mansoor rather, in a U.S. military drone attack. For decades, the West has accused Pakistan of harboring terrorist groups and using them as proxies to project power in the region, a claim that has been wildly denied by Islamabad. The question that we are asking here is why is Hafiz Saeed, India's most wanted terrorist, a man with the U.S. bounty of $10 million on his head and a United Nations declared terrorist still not being reined in? Just yesterday, U.S. National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster said that Donald Trump expects Pakistan to reduce its support to terror groups. He said that they have fought very hard against terrorist organizations, but they have done so only selectively. Joining us this evening on Gravitas, I have with me in the studio G. Parthasati, former High Commissioner to Pakistan. Good evening to you, sir. We also have uh, retired Major Sarwar Jahan Chaudhary, a security expert from Dhaka, and retired Colonel Shafkat Saeed, the defense analyst from Islamabad. We'll also be joined by Ray Locker, National Security Editor of USA Today, in just a few minutes from now. Good evening to all of you. Mr. Parthasati, why a political party? What purpose does it serve for someone like Hafiz Saeed? Look, uh, he's, un he's under arrest now. Uh, he is out of the public domain. Mm. And he would like some uh, uh, publicity. Uh, that's, that's quite natural. In fact, I am not too unhappy that he's joining politics. Mm. Because when, he, remember one thing, he's an internationally listed, listed terrorist with a reward of $10 million on his head. I'm sure the number, once they find him in politics, there'll be more people looking for those $10 million. That's point number one. Point number two, let's see what the Pakistan Election Commission says. Will the Pakistan Muslim Milli Party be accorded if there is a chief election commission like, uh, commissioner like... But he's close to the ISI. No, the army, well, the there's Pakistan. a chief election commissioner like the last one, Justice Fakhruddin. Uh, Chaudhary, who's I doubt, Ibrahim, mm. who I doubt very much would accept him. But let us see. The point is this. I've, I've been three weeks in the U.S., mm. a week in Afghanistan. Jamatu, the, the Lashkar-e-Taiba is also in Afghanistan, I found in talking to Afghan friends. 
are listed for attacks on our consulate in Kandahar, Jalalabad, and Herat, along with the uh, Haqqani network. So, right now, and what I saw in the US, there is no sympathy for guys of this character. If Pakistan chooses to go this way, it's choice. I also noticed that Maulana Samuel Haq is entering uh, politics as a political party, something which won't please the Iranians given his killing of Shias. So I think Pakistan will have to make up its mind which way its politics goes. I don't expect these guys to win too many seats. I mean, that will go to the major, major political party. But it's not going to do Pakistan's global standing any good. I'm not losing any sleep on that. You know, it's baffling. For a layperson, it's baffling. A man has a $10 million bounty on mm. his head. A man is accused of such serious crimes, mm. like terrorist attacks. Mm. And look at what the Pakistani constitution mandates a person entering. I'm sure most people will not qualify for that good mm. character mm. and uh, so on and so forth. Mm. So winning an election comes later. What, what is the point of a house I, I, arrest? He the, has the, access the, to internet, point, he has visitors, he has, he has everything that, that you would have. Yeah. So the, peop, the, the security present outside his house is more for his security uh, it, it, than for it's, arresting it's, it's him. Just, he's a megalomaniac. I think he wants more publicity. As, as long as Nawaz Sharif was around, he was locked up. Hmm. I don't know what will happen after Nawaz has left. You think Nawaz Sharif was doing this despite the military? Who? Nawaz, Sharif. Nawaz had him locked up, yes. So I think the military wouldn't have said no. Uh, he was address, uh, arrested on January 31st. Mm. He's in jail till September 7, and that has been extended. So, as I said, uh, l let us see how this uh, uh, plays out. Mm. Because I am frankly delighted at the prospect of seeing MLA Hafiz Mohammad Saeed. I mean, wh what is the image he's going to present to the world it, of the Pakistan Parliament? I'm, I'm not sure, sure the world most still needs convincing about what's happening in yeah, Pakistan. And, and look. The U.S. is not what it was. Trump is a completely different kettle of fish when it comes to this. I've been there long enough for a month. And in Afghanistan, they're just waiting for him for those uh, uh, cases of attacks on our consulates. Let's, let's get a view from Pakistan. Colonel Saeed, why is he doing this? What is your reading? What does Hafiz Saeed get from floating a political party? He may, in all likelihood, not be allowed to contest an election. Uh, have a lot of problems before he can uh, he's eligible or allowed to contest election he would not be able to go and straight away register his party though he has announced launching of a party but getting it registered would also require a lot of uh, he has to cross a lot of obstacles before that and th those obstacles are basically because of the international pressure especially american pressure and uh, whatever he is accused for Hearts and hearts, Americans also know that he is being alive for his involvement in Indian uh, incidents in India. Whereas uh, uh, things like uh, Ajmal Kasab's uh, link to him is also nullified after the, your own uh, investigation departments have uh, given it in writing in the court that uh, Ajmal Kasab was in custody once 2611 took place. So things like that makes uh, the case weak against him. And uh, though, but even then, it is very difficult for him to have, uh, uh, just like any other party, launch his party and contest the elections. He would have a lot of problems. But as far as his popularity is concerned, I would tell you that the themes that he is going to uh, hinge to are very popular, like uh, end of corruption, uh, Kashmir cause. And these are the things which are going to draw very big crowds and he is going to be very popular in, amongst the masses. You know what beats me? You are, I think the fourth guest from Pakistan this evening who is essentially implying that the onus uh, of stopping Hafiz Saeed from fo floating a political party and contesting an election is on India. India should provide more proof so that this doesn't happen. Uh, we don't we, have to do anything. He is listed by the Americans. We are not put $10 million on his head. The Americans have. The Afghans whom I spoke to, mm. both in Kabul and later on I went to Panjshir, they said this guy and they, uh, was involved, uh, has been involved in the attacks on our consulates. So why should I worry if Pakistan wants to send a, send a joker like this fellow who is an international pariah to their parliament, good for them, let them do it. Major Chaudhary, what do you, what do you make of this move? Uh, do you believe that there is... The army, there's an army hand in this. They want their man in office. 
And Hafiz Saeed is a man they've picked? Oh, well, I mean, uh, as far as Pakistan Army is concerned and uh, the kind of information that we have, uh, in, in Pakistani strategic circle, especially the, the conservative army people, they always consider these non-state actors and terrorists as some kind of strategic asset. So if this, that kind of psychology or this, that kind of philosophy is not, is not changed, hmm. then overall the situation will not improve. So uh, due to international pressure, at some stage, Hafiz Saeed will probably uh, be, uh, be tried or he's already under house arrest. So, so, so all these sorts of things are happening uh, to one person. But in Pakistan, the, the radical network, the terror network is not just one person. It is a very wide network. They do terror act in their own country, in other, other neighboring countries, and also export terrorism in, in, uh, in, in different parts of South Asia and Islamic world. So, uh, uh, so as long as this harboring of, of, of terror networks as, as some sort of weird strategic asset uh, this this notion remains in in Pakistan establishment, or I mean, especially in the military. Uh, this this thing is is not not um, going to go away so 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 quickly. I keep coming back to that question, uh, Mr. Parthasarthi. Yeah. This is a man who had cabinet ministers flocking to his rallies. Uh -huh. He was running a parallel system. We yeah. at Vion did a report that he was collecting agricultural tax. Yeah. So why should he take the risk of? Uh, of floating a political is, party, do you see the army's is, the, the army's well, hand as well, a game plan? I, 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 the army is not going to object to it. As I said, there is a streak of uh, uh, megalomania in him. Uh, don't uh, don't forget when I was high commissioner, hmm. I remember the governor of Punjab, hmm. Shahid Hamid, and the um, Mushahid Hussain Said minister. Going and calling on him and paying their respects. They call him a humanitarian worker. Yeah, so, has he has so, he bought so, into the propaganda no, no, himself so, that so, I am so helping fine. people? He is also there listed in the killing of those eight Americans in an American court. So let the Afghans deal with him, and perhaps uh, one day he'll come under a drone. So uh, there there are many ways these guys are dealt with, uh, and uh, he 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 will be dealt with like that. I, I, you know, the point is this, as I said, if there are, is a serious chief election commissioner, uh, like Justice Fakhruddin Ibrahim, I don't think this guy's party will get recognition. But if they do, good luck to them. A lot of charity work, f fair enough. Let him enter the Pakistan National Assembly. They will, then the Pakistan parliament will have the dubious distinction of having a member who has $10 million on its head. Don't you see the, pop, the benefit and love and affection, affection the all Pakistan's neighbors who suffer from terrorism, whether it is Afghanistan or India or even Iran? Mm. Even the Iranians say uh, that they are uh, f uh, they're fund funding attacks on Iranian soil. So, just I think as far as we are concerned, mm. sit back and watch it. If they want to commit harakiri, it's their business politically. But this is this is amounting to political harakiri. That is all fine, but you know when when 166 yeah, yeah, people I, lost I, their I, lives, I, when I, they see someone I, like Hafiz Said, you know, as, 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 uh, his I, people I, holding as, a press as conference. I, said, I would love them to do it. Yes, but please do it. It'll be it'll give me great pleasure, because as I said, what I've heard in Washington, what I've heard in Kabul, mm. Hafiz Muhammad Said is not exactly a, an incarnation of the Pope in Pakistan. Period. Colonel Said. How do Pakistanis yes. see this and what does the law say? Help us understand, can someone with as serious charges as Hafiz Saeed against him be allowed to float a political party and contest an election? Ma'am, uh, I would like to first of all uh, make few, uh, I would not call it rebuttal, but submissions to Mr. Parsati. By all means. I would ask uh, Mr. Parsati, I have been participating with him a number of times, but I hope that he gives me patient hearing. I would ask him that why are Americans not so serious in taking him out? And do you think that if Americans are serious in taking Hafiz Saeed out, would they not force Pakistan to hand him over? And I tell, I want to tell him that Americans know more about Hindutva and uh, RSS and these things because of uh, 
uh, he, he went to Washington, but I want him to know that what Americans know about India, Ameri especially uh, American uh, envoys. American envoys. All right, let me come. I was very patient. I yeah, yeah, please, patient. please, please. Sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't beat you. I Go. said I would make. I no, would no, be please. Making Go ahead. Take these submissions. Yeah. I I think that uh, Mr. Karkare before his death had met American uh, uh, diplomatic staff and he had disclosed to them that what is the extent of ingress of RSS and like other extremist Hinduist organization into the government and the armed forces and what they are doing. So with all that, if they put money on Hafiz Saeed's head, mm -hmm. I think it is more of pleasing India to buy whatever they want to sell to you, like 30 year old F-16 with manufacturing, which you would construct after, 30, uh, which you would make, uh, build them after 30 years. So you can imagine 30 year old aircraft today, you would be building it 30 years later. So I think that for all that, if they put money on Hafiz Saeed, it's all right. I don't mind it. But as far as Hafiz Saeed is concerned, I think your people came and they met him. Hmm. You need to ask them. They have been gagged and they have been blacked out. You need to know about those very prominent Indian journalists and politicians who have come and met him. And what he told them, please know that. And I think you need to literally have paradigm shift in your approach to Pakistan, Pakistani politics and Pakistani stand on Kashmir. Well, Which Pakistani is politics is witnessing a paradigm shift if they're going to let someone like Hafiz Saeed uh, float a political party. But, but uh, I, I may not agree with everything that he said, but I do want to ask you this. Are, are the Americans... Just, just a second. Colonel Saeed, let me take your question forward. Let me take it forward. Are the Americans serious? Donald Trump has been saying for months now, from his election campaign to later, we will hold Pakistan accountable. When is he going to walk the talk? Well, I think they are in the process of putting it together. If you see the Senate and the House legislation, hmm. moved by no less than Senator McCain, it's pretty tough and talks about taking out people. Uh, words to that effect, uh, which you have not seen earlier. Uh, you, you've heard McMaster, you've heard Mattis. Uh, they're quite clear. So what they're doing is putting together a policy which they find will be viable. It will take time. But I go back to a very fundamental thing. Hmm. Go and visit Afghanistan. Do you know a Pakistani cannot go to the market in Kabul wearing a salwar kameez and he has to pretend he is Indian? They are hated that much there. So the fact of the matter is they are living in a world of denial. And finally I would request Colonel Shafkat Saeed who is a very learned man mm. to please read the latest book called The Exile about Osama bin Laden's 14 years in Pakistan. It is revelation of everybody. And don't tell me that this is false propaganda. This is by two of the most eminent writers in the world on these matters who wrote the book Deception also. So I would suggest I don't have to prove anything. Everybody, everything is being done by your American friends. You are a major non-NATO ally, not us. Uh, so uh, when, when your major non-NATO allies does all this for us, I'm naturally happy. You should question them, why are you asking me? And you, you wait till the reaction comes. So, if what, is you, what, you, what you've said is all, all the statements from America. Yeah. I come back to the, no, the look, point, look, look, it's the, just lip look, service the, look, it seems. Look, look, the actions are, all aid has been cut off, virtually. They're getting paid coalition support funds. Pakistan, what are the leverage Pakistan is a country with a serious, serious balance of payments problem. You should listen to Mr. Rishak Dar or to SN Iqbal, don't listen to me. Hmm. And they will explain it to you. So if they want to squeeze, they get themselves squeezed economically, fine. China will give them credits and uh, milk them like they milked uh, Sri Lanka. But they are into serious balance of payments problems. It's not going to be easy to say boo to the West. And Hafiz Saeed has not been banned just by the US. His outfit has been banned by the UK, mm. by the EU, by Australia and by Russia. Even Russia because the jamaat ud dawa had activities in Chechnya. So he's, uh, if such a person wants to join the Pakistan uh, uh, legislature, please I would advise them don't take him on any delegation to any of these countries, whether Russia, e UK or EU or most importantly not to Afghanistan, they lynch him. <laughs>
Major, Major Chaudhary, Major Chaudhary, my question to you then is, uh, what does it mean for the region? We all know, I mean, it's uh, everyone watching the show also understands the kind of person Hafiz Saeed is and the implications. But what does it mean for the region when someone like him is allowed this opportunity, given this platform, to contest an election? I mean, uh, this is a very interesting question. I mean, uh, allowing a, a, a person who is who is, uh, I mean, who is, who has been declared a terrorist by so many countries, to come to the mainstream. So, does does that uh, do any good to Pakistani politics, or if the terrorist are, terrorists are allowed to come to mainstream politics, will they give up terrorism? So, these are like uh, very, uh, very, very big theoretical questions. But uh, in reality, I mean, if we take some some past. Uh, I mean, I mean, some of the characteristics of the terrorists. I mean, they never change. We, you have seen in in UK, there were, and in Europe, there were people who were suspected, who were apprehended, and because of the liberal values of those countries, they were at some stage released, and then then they carried out terrorist attacks. Mm. So this is very difficult to imagine that if you have an ideal, if you have a plan to mainstream. I mean, get terrorism rid of them. This this may not be possible. So uh, there there has to be a, a unique way of containment or confinement to deal to deal with this kind of people, and so that they are they are not in touch with the mainstream and cannot cannot do harm to to the mainstream society in their in their own country or and also in in neighboring countries. Mr. Parthasarthi, uh, I am not entirely convinced about America's role, so I will ask you this again. Yeah. We see the kind of action uh, that we see on North Korea, yeah. sanctions, uh. Russia, sanctions, mm. tough language. Mm. But with Pakistan, it seems they just stop short of taking the action. See the legislation. Trump can do anything, he can't move from the legislation. And I have worked with the Senate and Congress now since the 80s. Mm. I have never seen a, such a tough resolution on terrorism on any country. Yes. Naturally, they will not like to push Pakistan to such a corner that they don't give them an escape route. But the days of going so, so soft on terrorism and are, now, are over. And you should only, and if you visit Afghanistan, you should meet General Nicholson, the American military commander, hmm. uh, who has his own views on these subjects. Okay. Colonel Said, before we wrap this up, I want to ask you, where does this leave the likes of uh, Imran Khan, who until today, many believe, was the army's choice. Imran Khan is not at all army's choice, as far as I'm concerned. Imran Khan is becoming people's choice. But uh, I want to tell Parsati Saab that I heard McCain once he led a congressional uh, delegation to Pakistan and he visited Fata and Balochistan, Gwadar and interior of Punjab and Sindh. And I listened to his talk one that he gave us in Islamabad. So he should not count on Mr. McCain. And if Mr. Modi after Gujarat uh, debacle can become Prime Minister of India with 2,000 people's blood on his hand, uh, which is proven fact that it happened in his uh, chief minister uh, term, then I think Hafiz Saeed has uh, less blood on his hand and that is also alleged because your own Indian uh, official sources disprove the theory that he is behind uh, 26 elements. So if he becomes the Prime Minister, I think he would be as welcome abroad with 126 people alleged uh, blood on his hand. Yes, then congratulations. No, I, 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 think, I, I think I cannot let the comment about uh, Mr. Modi pass. I would be very optimistic if I say that he will let, become Prime Minister. Let me remind my Pakistani friend that a Supreme case, Court... Oh, just a minute. I think you made your point. You made your point. We don't want to fight here. Let, 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 let me remind yes. them that the Supreme Court ordered investigation has established the innocence of Mr. Mr. of Mr. Modi in the Gujarat riots. So no, that is not the case. Nor has any international tribunal had anything to say about it. So forget about it. There is no equation. It's like um, uh, it was. It is like. Um, it is like comparing uh, Al, Capo Al Capone, the American criminal, uh, with President Roosevelt. <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. And thank you very much, Colonel Saeed, uh, uh, G. Parthasarthi, of course, and Major Chaudhary. Thank you for joining us here 
on Gravitas. Uh, this is a subject uh, that we will be discussing in the days ahead, I have a feeling, because we'll hear more from Pakistan and the reactions coming in. But some weeks ago, and just for a brief while, the world seemed to be waking up to Pakistan's true colors, uh, and they're far from pretty. India has for long been frustrated by the West's self-serving distinctions between terror groups targeting Western countries and those attacking India. For decades, Pakistan has nurtured, sponsored, armed and trained terrorists of groups like the lashkar e toiba the jaish e Mohammed, and the Hizbul Mujahideen. And its army has obliged by helping them infiltrate the borders to India and wreak terror, mostly upon innocent civilians. But even after many of its own citizens were killed in the bloodshed in Mumbai on 26-11-2008 by the lashkar e toiba amply aided by Pakistan's ISI, India's pleased to take action against Pakistan for providing a safe haven fell upon deaf ears. There was some lip service, for sure, token proscriptions, but to the West, Pakistan remained a quote-unquote crucial partner in its own anti-terror wars in the region. Now the Lashkar Toiba is changing colors yet again, and this time wants to morph into a political party. Both the US and the UK, chief allies in the global anti-terror war, have pointed to Pakistan as the mother load of terrorism directed against India and even upon its own people in Balochistan. And India had every reason to smile. But who said what before? And are they likely to still keep their blinkers on? Senior Foreign Editor Padma Rao answers those questions. Former Secretary of State John Kerry in 2013 called Pakistan a hard-working democracy, one important for regional stability. The U.S. State Department report in 2016 calls Pakistan a safe haven for terror groups like the lashkar e taiba and the jamaat ud dawa groups that are openly engaging in fundraising. It also points out that lashkar e taibas chief Hafiz Saeed still addresses large rallies in Pakistan. The United States provided aid of more than $1.6 billion to Pakistan even after Osama bin Laden was found in a Pakistan cantonment in 2013. A congressional panel says it will impose tougher aid conditions if no action is taken against terror groups and it indeed does block aid for no action against the Haqqani network. In 2013, the United Kingdom's former Prime Minister David Cameron said enemies of Pakistan are enemies of Britain. In 2017, Tory MP Bob Blackman says that the conflict in Jammu and Kashmir is sponsored by Pakistan to spread terror in India. A former foreign minister of Israel in 2005 said he hoped for a full diplomatic relationship with Pakistan. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu shied away from naming Pakistan, merely saying that any country with terror groups must take action. Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina said in 2016 that the two countries have to solve problems, but relations between Bangladesh and Pakistan will remain. The Sri Lankan president said in 2015 that there was an abiding friendship with Pakistan. A Nepal envoy pointed out to the complementarities between Nepal and Pakistan in 2017. And Maldives president Yamin said in 2016 that there were close neighborly relations with Pakistan. Padma Rao, Beyond. This weekend's United Nations Security Council vote unanimously approved sanctions for North Korea. This could slash North Korea's $3 billion export revenue by a third. Leaders of the U.S. and South Korea spoke today and decided to apply what they call maximum pressure on the North. Meanwhile, China has expressed hopes that talks will begin soon. Our next report breaks down the Korean crisis for you. The latest sanctions against North Korea could hurt the country's earnings from exports by a billion dollars. Today, the full Security Council has come together to put the North Korean dictator on notice. The U.S. drafted resolution bans export of coal, iron, lead and seafood after Pyongyang tested two intercontinental ballistic missiles in July. A U.N. diplomat says North Korea earned $400 million from coal, $251 million from iron and iron ore, $113 million from lead and lead ore, and $295 million from seafood. It also bans countries from increasing the number of North Korean laborers working abroad and from initiating any new joint ventures with the country. North Korea denounced the sanctions and says it will not place its nuclear program on the negotiating table. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson says China and Russia's support of the sanctions sends a strong message to North Korea. We're not going to give someone a specific 
number of days or weeks. This is really about the spirit of these talks, and they can demonstrate they're ready to sit with the spirit of, of finding a way forward in these talks by no longer conducting these missile tests. I think perhaps the most, the more important element of that is just the message that this uh, sends to North Korea of how unacceptable the entire international community finds what they're doing. North Korea has accused the US and South Korea of escalating the situation. In a tweet, Trump said he was very happy and impressed with the 15-0 United Nations vote on the sanctions. The United States president has been frustrated that China hasn't done more to stop North Korea. President Trump has even threatened sanctions on Chinese firms doing business with Pyongyang. China is North Korea's biggest trade partner and says it will support the sanctions, but that the sanctions are no lasting solution. While supportive of the new UN action, non-permanent Security Council member Sweden said sanctions alone will not solve the problem. The resolution would add North Korea's foreign trade bank, the primary foreign exchange bank, to a UN sanctions blacklist, which provides for an assets freeze. It would also tighten trade restrictions on technology to prevent North Korea from acquiring items that could be used for its military programs. North Korea has also forced more than 50,000 people to work abroad, mainly in Russia and China, to generate nearly $2 billion for the government. Under the measure, North Korean vessels were caught violating UN resolutions and thus would be banned from entering ports in all countries. Bureau Report, Vion. And as we call it in the news business, what's the India angle in this story? Just last month, India's Ministry of External Affairs released a strong statement condemning North Korea's intercontinental ballistic missile launch, saying it poses a grave threat to India's security and international peace. In April, the government of India aligned with the United Nations to ban trade with North Korea, except for food and medicine, which brought an end to trade uh, of a decade of growth between the two countries. India's policy shift with North Korea could strengthen relations with the US and South Korea. Even though India is not a significant trade partner compared to someone like uh, Russia or China, it is still a blow to North Korea. Many North Korean students underwent training at the Center for Space, Science and Technology in Asian and uh, the, and, and the Pacific located in Dehradun. It's one of the few in the world that provides this typical technical training. This is after the United Nations uh, in its first set of sanctions against North Korea's nuclear program in 2006. India's government says that uh, New Delhi is Pyongyang's third largest trade partner exporting more than $110 million in goods while importing $88 million worth of uh, goods from Pyongyang. This means that North Korea will have to be more economically dependent on China. Now, three world leaders in three different parts of the world, Justin Trudeau in China, Emmanuel Macron in France, and Shinzo Abe in Japan are all seeing a dip in their popularity ratings. Just what did they do to go from the giddy heights they occupied when they came first into office to the doldrums? Senior Foreign Editor Padma Rao takes a look. From the day he took office as Canada's new Prime Minister, Trudeau mania has coursed like wildfire across the world. The politically correct, ever-smiling Justin Trudeau who oozed charm wherever he showed up. Be it on Donald Trump's front lawn or in a Canadian Hindu temple, at an LGBT parade or patting baby's cheeks at a rally, the world fell in love with Justin Trudeau and seemed ready to elevate him to global premier if there could be such a title. But Trudeau's fortunes have dipped to their lowest since he was sworn into office nearly two years ago. An opinion poll held earlier this year corroborated an earlier one in late 2016. Trudeau's liberals have begun to trail the oppositional conservatives. And at the heart of it is a budget that has got backs up across Canada. Nearly half of 1,029 Canadians who participated opposed Trudeau's proposal to privatize the country's airports, to sell some of its biggest ports, to lay more pipelines and sell military vehicles to Saudi Arabia. Across the Atlantic, another pretty boy, France's youngest ever president Emmanuel Macron is not having it easy either. He was the proverbial outsider who dared confront and end the domination of the Elysee Palace by both of France's established political parties. 
tired of the stodgy ex-president Hollande, the French loved Macron's suits, his blue eyes, and the fact that he had done something flamboyantly outré, marry a woman several decades older than him and stay married for a decade. But barely three months in office, France's love affair with Macron seems to have ended because of proposed restrictions on workers' rights and the labor market. 49% of those surveyed disapprove, while only 36% approve. The worst popularity drop for any French president in the past 20 years. There are rumblings of dissatisfaction in the Far East too. The sun does not seem to be rising for Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who had to reshuffle his cabinet last week in an attempt to better his flagging popularity. From becoming Japan's youngest post-war Prime Minister in 2006 to a third re-election in 2014, Abe has come a long way. But charges of cronyism, that's not something Japan is taking kindly to. But Marao, beyond. As they say, anyone who's popular is bound to be disliked at some point. It's happening too fast for these leaders. Still ahead on the show, why has Israel banned Al Jazeera? Is Netanyahu colluding with Arab states against Qatar? Was Al Jazeera's coverage biased? A lot of questions. We'll try to answer some. Welcome back. For weeks now, the government of Israel, led by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, has been accusing Al Jazeera of inciting violence. Now they've decided to ban it in the country, sparking a debate about how far governments can go to control the media, even if they think that the reporting is biased. The other big question, of course, is whether Israel is siding with other Gulf states to further corner Qatar. Here's a report. The Gulf crisis involving Qatar and seven other countries has taken an unexpected turn. The Saudi-led group of Gulf states have found a new ally in Jewish-majority Israel. On Sunday, Jerusalem announced that it is planning to block the Doha-based news channel Al Jazeera. This comes weeks after Prime Minister Netanyahu announced action against the news channel, claiming it was inciting violence in Jerusalem. <laughs> Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu lashed out at Al Jazeera after its coverage of the July 14th attack outside the Al-Aqsa Mosque in East Jerusalem, in which two policemen were killed. Al Jazeera denied that its coverage of the attack had caused unrest in Jerusalem. The channel said it will take necessary legal measures if Israel moves to ban the news channel. <laughs> In a statement, the Doha-based media network denounced the steps taken by a country which claims to be the only democracy in the Middle East. Al Jazeera also denied the charges that its coverage of the Al-Aqsa Mosque unrest was unprofessional.
Meanwhile, rights groups, journalists and media organizations have condemned Israel's decision to shut down Al Jazeera's operations in Jerusalem. The Committee to Protect Journalists said that Israel should abandon its undemocratic plans. A legislative process to ban the channel can only begin after Israel's parliament reconvenes at the end of October. And even then it would have to pass through government ministries and be approved by the Attorney General, who in turn would have to determine whether such an amendment violates the constitution by impeding freedom of expression. Al Jazeera has previously faced government censure in Egypt too. In 2014, Egypt had jailed three of the network staffers for seven years and closed its offices. Zara Khan for Weon. And joining us this evening, Dr. Vai Lavad, the writer and political analyst who understands the affairs of the Middle East very well. Also, Arsen Ostrovsky, executive director of the Israeli Jewish Congress with us from Tel Aviv. Good evening to both of you, Dr. Avad. The Israeli minister has said that Al Jazeera is a tool of the Islamic State, Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran. And we are the only one who have not determined then something delusional is happening. Basically, he's making a case for why Al Jazeera should be banned. Do you agree with what Israel is saying and doing? Well, I think it was, the, we used to call Al Jazeera when it was starting, that it was the voice of the Israelis and the American at that time, when they were only voices you can hear an Israeli commentator would have been on Al Jazeera because they believed that they have to listen to the views and the other view. So they were giving both sides the equality, and that's why we've been uh, blamed for many times why they are showing the Israeli side of view on, on the story, especially when it comes to the occupied territories in Palestine. But uh, I don't see the decision of the Israelis really is uh, against Al Jazeera and contrary. I would see it from different angle because it is more of helping Al Jazeera, gaining its popularity that it has lost ever since the Arab Spring started, because ever since then, Al Jazeera took side in the war, and they have been quite supportive of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, since then in the North African state of the Arab country world, and also in Syria and Iraq and in Yemen. And now they are uh, uh, talking about every authoritarian regimes of the dictators, except barring Al Qatar and GCC. But we can see now what the new New development in the Arab world in Yemen and after they have been accused of supporting Islam, taking a different view. In regard to Israel, during the Aqsa crisis, the recent one, I tried to use this, politicize the issues because there are many of the GCC countries who are trying to gain our normalized relation with Israel. So there were good talks of uh, even Netanyahu, I think there is a good closer relation and more Arab countries are coming forward to Israel, uh, close uh, ties and opening offices, especially in the, in the GCC country. Uh, and uh, that's why they, they felt there was a kind of, uh, uh, you know, hotbed uh, happening, uh, warm bed on those issues. But suddenly Al-Aqsa Mosque erupted and then the Al Jazeera start uh, accusing those GCC countries that while you are normalizing, you forgot the Arab cause, which is called the Palestinian cause. Well, one can safely assume that uh, helping Al Jazeera boost its popularity was not the idea when this uh, move was first announced. Uh, Arsen, help us understand why the government of Israel is doing this. Is it to cozy up to uh, the other Gulf states or are they really worried about the kind of reportage they see on Al Jazeera? Look, I, I think it's the latter. I mean, I, I don't think Israel is uh, too concerned over their uh, judgment process is being dictated by some of the Gulf and other Arab countries in the, in the region. But the reality of the matter is, look, Israel is not concerned about uh, Al Jazeera's ratings. They're concerned about, uh, about stopping on Simon and violence. That's the primary concern. But from Israel's perspective, the way they look at the situation is that I think uh, Al Jazeera has long ceased to be a professional um, balance news organization and instead that they've become essentially a, uh, a proxy or a propaganda arm for the Qatari government, for the PA and the Hamas and the Hezbollah. And in doing so, they what they are doing, and very dangerously so, is uh, quite uh, literally they're inciting violence in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. We saw that especially after the the July 14 murder of the two police officers, which, uh, which Al Jazeera famously reported as altercation on the Temple Mount resulted in three Palestinians being shot. This wasn't an altercation. Mm. This was a brutal mm. murder by uh, two, uh, sorry, by three um, Arab Muslims. 
uh, who killed in cold blood two Israeli officers. So with all due respect to Al Jazeera, I think Al Jazeera denying that they are biased is the same as a tobacco company denying that smoking causes cancer. Let me tell you what the Fretz, uh, Foreign Press Association had to say, and I'm quoting here, Arsen. Censoring Al Jazeera or closing its offices will, only bring, will not bring stability to the region, but it will put Israel firmly in the camp of some of the region's worst enemies of press freedom. How do you answer those who say that this is probably a reaction of Israel's uh, persecution complex? Look, I don't think there's any persecution complex. Israel has a very robust, have a, has a very open uh, democracy, both uh, domestically here. You'll, you see uh, television, print, radio, uh, online being very critical. There's a very high threshold to dissent. We see news organizations from the major mainstream um, organizations like CNN, Guardian, um, ABC, constantly reporting and often making mistakes. You know, mistakes are fine. Uh, from time to time. However, when it comes to Al Jazeera, it's not simply mistakes, it's a systematic uh, form of bias, of incitement, of whipping up violence um, in the area, in Jerusalem, and of giving a platform, as you often see on their broadcasts, to uh, extremists and terrorists. So from Israel's perspective, again, this is not an issue about uh, free speech or uh, democracy. There's a very open and robust democracy here, but it's an issue of uh, taking action against a news organization that has long ceased to be professional, has become uh, essentially a propaganda arm inciting violence. So is banning them the best option? Uh, Dr. Avad, I'm completely out of time, but as a journalist, your closing comments, sir. Well, I will uh, say that I will uh, support uh, I will support the channel not to be closed, uh, but I will never agree with their content of the story. And we have to differentiate between the Arabic and the English version of the Al Jazeera. And one has to focus on their uh, propagation and, and all their propaganda machine they have used inside the Arab countries. And I think the Gulf state Calling it for a closer would have been a disaster because they are partnered in the crimes also. But Israel, to call it, to close it, it is something that one has to focus, that Israel used to see itself as a democracy and the only democracy in the Middle East, as Al Jazeera said. Now they are closing it. I think there is something behind the scene we need to more to explore in next time when we talk about it. Absolutely. Dr. Avad, Arsen Ostrovsky, thanks very much. These are difficult questions to answer. How far can the state go? Our next story will uh, will dwell on how far the press can go. And we're talking about Princess Diana. Almost 20 years have passed since her untimely de death, but uh, Princess Diana continues to grab headlines. A new documentary was aired in the UK last night, broadcasting startling conversation of the People's Princess, as she was called, with her voice coach. Beyond London Bureau Chief Mandy Clark sent us this report. We're leaving you with this. Thanks very much for watching. A royal wedding, a bitter divorce and a tragic death. Late Princess Diana's life continues to be one of the most captivating in British history. UK's Channel 4 on Sunday aired a new TV documentary, Diana, in her own words. Broadcasting candid recordings, taped by her voice coach, Peter Settlin, giving insights into her shattered love life. The tapes were filmed in the 1990s. In it, she discusses her troubled marriage to Prince Charles, her public image and private battles. She said when she first met Charles, he was all over her like a bad rash. He was inconsistent when it came to dating. She would call her every day for a week and then she wouldn't hear from him and from three weeks she said his behavior was very odd. Later when they were married she confronted him about his affair with Camilla Parker Bowles but he replied that he wouldn't be the only Prince of Wales without a mistress. She talked candidly about her battles with bulimia and said the royal family were aware of it but they blamed it on her failed marriage. The royal family have not commented on the documentary. The documentary became a controversy even before it went on air as many critics claimed that it was an intrusion of Diana's right to privacy. Despite the call for boycott, the documentary was too hard to resist for many. The tell-all tape secured over an average of 3.5 million views, making it the most watched show of Channel 4 this year. August 31st will mark Diana's 20th death anniversary. Sadly, in spite of her humanitarian contributions, Diana continues to be remembered for the controversy that her life was. With Mandy Clark in London, Bureau Report, we on.